Hello and welcome back to the first episode of the V8 Supercars fancast of the 2019 season. We did it. We've made it back to racing. That's right. Racing is back. The Adelaide 500 has been and gone. And the season of supercars is once again upon us. I, of course, will be covering every race through the season, and I can't wait to do it because we had a thrilling round in Adelaide. Thrilling. And we learnt a lot, a lot to talk about, um, a lot of things to speculate upon, and uh, to discuss, to discuss uh, everybody's pace, because I was surprised of how strong the Mustangs were. Uh, I really was, but... Actually, no, let's talk about that right now. Um, okay, so, as you will see, if you've uh, if you've actually watched the races, which I recommend you do before you listen to me waffle on about them, because I'll spoil them, obviously. Um, and when we get to the results, you will see that the Mustangs were pretty dominant, uh, aside from a few... <sighs> dumb things? There's a lot of dumb things that happened at Adelaide. <laughs> there was a lot of very strange things that went on. Um... But aside from a few minor issues, a few mistakes, um, pretty much all the Mustangs were very strong and had the ability to finish within the top 10. Within the top 5, really, um, if there had been less than 5 Mustangs on the grid. Um, so, I really wasn't expecting the Mustangs to be that strong. Um, we did see them in testing they topped the time shoots but i was pretty convinced that they were uh low fuel uh new tire runs because they happened right at the end of the day um for all of the tickford mustangs in particular um so i was pretty convinced that tickford at least were just doing low fuel glory runs uh to make a headline um but no the pace that tickford has this year is real which is Great for Tickford. It was a bit of a shame that they weren't in it at all last year. Um, and more people at the pointy end of the competition is great for us. That's all you can really ask for. Um, so it's good to see Tickford back in form. Uh, maybe a bit of a shame for two of the drivers that are gone. <laughs> uh, Mark Winterbottom and Richie Stanaway, that they're no longer in a team that has made such a successful rebound. But... What would Tickford know? Because Mark Winterbottom is 7th in the championship and above most of their drivers, so... (laughs) Maybe he made the right choice after all. Um, But Scott McLaughlin, absolutely dominant performance. Um, I think he finished race 1 some ridiculous amount of time ahead. uh, 12 seconds, I think. Um, And half the, half the, the field... I can't talk. Half the field lapped by him. Um, And the only reason it fell from 12 seconds is because uh, you just stopped trying (laughs) towards the end of the race when you got a margin that big. Um, Yeah, Scotty was absolutely dominant um, on the weekend. And yeah, the the gap was much smaller on race two. Um, But again, Scotty was just conserving. You can really tell. Um, He wasn't putting his all into it um in the last 20 laps he was ahead um they didn't want him to pull out too far in case of a safety car um so he just hung out about four seconds ahead of cameron and that was it that was all he needed to do he just rode at home um djr are definitely going to be difficult to beat this year um but that doesn't mean anything really i mean shane took out um, both races in the Adelaide 500 last year and yeah it was close last year but that's what we want uh, but he didn't win the championship and it by was no means a landslide um, after the first two rounds last year I think um, DJR was winning every single race <laughs> with McLaughlin so um yeah, there's no guarantee at all that uh, Red Bull aren't out of it, of course, um, or even Reynolds or anyone like that. Um, it would be nice to see someone from DJR who isn't Scott McLaughlin to win a race, um, but that's up to Fabian Coulthard, isn't it? And uh, speaking of Coulthard, 
what a torrid weekend for him. Um, God. Qualified first in... I can't believe he did this. I can't believe I'm saying this. But he qualified first in the top 10 shootout. And he jumps the start. He jumps the start in the race. And I've just... I've not seen someone do that in a long time. Um, to be fair to him, uh, he it looks like he is reacting to Jamie Winkup doing the same thing. He said Jamie captures himself before he goes too far forward. Um, and Fabian didn't. So it was a rather large flinch. Um... And God, it looks awful. It looks awkward on the replays. Um, so yeah, obviously he was deemed for that. Um, and then once he came into the pits, um, both the DJR cars had this problem actually, but of course it was worse on Fabian's car because he has the lion's share of bad luck on that team. Um, where it looked like there was a ton of fuel leaking at the back. Um, not really sure what that one's about. <laughs> um... <laughs> it's a bit strange. Uh, when he came in for his second stop, they told him that if it happened again, he'd be getting a penalty. Uh, they made sure it didn't happen again. Um, but it did happen to Scott's car afterwards, but only a little bit. So that was weird. I don't know what that was. I don't know if that was some kind of uh, teaming issues with the new chassis or something, but that was weird. I've never seen that before, that's for sure. Um, I'm surprised it wasn't flagged earlier because it happened a lot. Um, you'd think dropping fuel on the road would be dangerous, but... There you go. Um, yep, so he got bumped down the order again. And then on Sunday, Sunday was even worse for him. It was awful. Um, he just had a, he just, he got, <laughs> he's got pushed back down the order. And then he had a, he had a stupid collision with, I think it was Scott Pye, where he just tried to be way too aggressive and he just clipped the very back rear of him and turned him around. Um, on one of the 90 degree angle corners, and I think it might have been turn four or something. Um, and it was just silly. He gave himself a 10 second penalty for that, and it was just, it was just silly. He was just some silly driving. Um, disqualified from the top 10 shooter for, let's be fair, not, not his own fault. Um, but uh, his car apparently wouldn't start, so the team opened the bonnet to look at it. Um, apparently, didn't do any work. Which I find to be incredible. They just opened the bonnet and looked at looked at it. Um, but uh, that broke Park Ferme conditions, which if, you, which if you don't know, Park Ferme is basically you can't touch the car. Um, that's basically all it means. It's a uh, very common in racing series um, that between um, you can only modify the car during practice, and then once qualifying rolls around you can make very limited modifications to maybe the downforce or brake bias or something like that um but you usually can't modify the car in any significant way uh especially not by working on it in pit bay waiting for your session to come around which is very clearly what they're kind of doing there's a I'm looking at a picture of them here with it open and a mechanic maybe his head down fiddle along with some things um even if they did open the bonnet and didn't do anything um if the rules, and they are, is just uh, you can't open the bonnet that breaks Park Ferme, then they broke Park Ferme. You can't do that. And if they did open the bonnet and didn't work on a thing, work on anything, then why did they open the bonnet at all? You know? Um, I, I find myself being very disappointed with DJR sometimes. Um, this happened a lot last year, where they'd make lots of really silly, amateurish mistakes as a team. Um, that almost solely focused around Fabian's car. <laughs> I don't really know how it happened. Yeah, Fabian didn't drive 100% great last year. Um, but it was stuff like this happened to him all the time last year. And it only happened to him. It never happened to Scotty. Um, obviously, I'm not, I'm not accusing them of any kind of weird conspiracy because that'd be stupid. I'm sure they want Fabian to finish just as high up as they want Scotty to finish because that gets them the team championship. And that's important. Um, but it is very strange that these things only ever seem to happen to Fabian and not to Scotty. Um, sucks for him because he was disqualified from the top 10 shootout. Uh, so he was automatically dropped into 10th and then he just had a poor race, really. Um, he didn't really make his way through the field, which is a shame because he's in a fast car and Scotty proved that he's in a very fast car. He proved that he was in a very fast car. His car was definitely faster than Scotty's on Saturday. Um, 
and just silly mistakes from the team and the driver. Um, but anyway, I have a quote here for those of you who might be um, doubting whether or not that really is a break of Park Ferme because it seems kind of, I don't know, inconsequential just opening the bonnet. But a Stewart's report reads that the Stewart's disqualified car number 12. Fabian Coulthard from the top 10 shootout for race two for a breach of rule D 6.3.5. The team worked on car number 12 after it was parked in the pit lane and while it was under park for May conditions without the permission from the HOM, who I don't know what that stands for. <laughs> so maybe I should have looked that up before I read it out. But all it means is that they, if they did have a problem, they needed to get permission to work on it. Um, and yeah, it's in pit lane and it's under Park Ferme, so that's a double no-no. Um, you just can't do it, really. You just can't do that. Um, and if, like I said, there are a lot of people saying that they didn't actually make any changes, they just opened the bonnet to have a look. But again, if they did just have opened the bonnet to have a look then and not make any changes, then why did they even open the bonnet to begin with? They must have known that they were breaking Park Ferme. Why take that risk? Um, I think it's pretty just, I think it's very much just they forgot that opening the bonnet itself breaks Park Fermo. I think that's what they forgot. Um, I think they were like, it's fine if we open the bonnet and don't touch anything. And, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't fine if they do that. So penalty, that's how it works really. Um, we have a lot of controversies with penalties. Um, I have one that I'm partic particularly mad about myself actually. And um, that I would like to get around to because I don't think anyone else saw it. I think everyone missed it, really. Um, and I sure, I sure haven't seen any news about it since. Uh, I've been looking for it. Um, but in race one, Lee Holdsworth uh, made a very strange crash at turn seven, I believe, um, where he came around the corner and it looks like he just plants the throttle um, while he's still at about a 45 degree angle and he just completely oversteers and spins. Um, <laughs> I've never really seen anyone do that before. It was very strange. It, lo it looks like he just plants the throttle halfway through the corner and, and decides that he wants to do a spin. Um, it's like what you, when you're playing a video game and you really want to flick the car around. Uh, he just does that. I don't really know why. Um, that's what it looks like. Um, I'm sure that's not what he actually did. <laughs> Unless he's just forgot how to drive his car for a second. But it sure looks like he just planted the throttle in the middle of the corner. But anyway, that means he ends up in the tyre barrier. Um, and with his car pointing out onto the racing line. And Scotty, Scott Pye, not Scott McLaughlin. Uh, about one and a half, two seconds behind him. Comes around the corner and completely unsighted. Just runs into him. Uh, ruins his race, all that stuff. Uh, ruins both their races, but I think Pi got the worst of it. Um, and then I see, then I see that uh, he's under investigation for ignoring yellow flags. Scott Pi is, and I was like, "What? <laughs> he's he would have? Was there even any time for anyone to wave yellow flags before he arrived there? Like he was, he wasn't very far behind Holdsworth. He didn't run into him on purpose." What? <laughs> it's, I think they flagged the investigation because he was running at full speed and that's why he ran into him. Um, but Pi was like two seconds behind Holdsworth. Of course he didn't see him. Of course he didn't see any yellow flags. I don't even think the marshals were waving them by then. And if they were, it would have been just before he hit him. So, what was that about? <laughs> it's, and then I see that... Then I see later on that it's gone to a post-race investigation. Um... I don't know what decision they made because I've scoured through the, I've scoured around the internet and I couldn't find any result um, to that penalty. I don't know why you would, I'd, I'm very upset by that because it was very clear that he didn't have any time to react. He was right, he was basically right behind Holdsworth, um, far enough away that he couldn't see what happened, but he, it's like two seconds, maybe three seconds. I, I'm not sure. I, do they really think... How fast do they think they can react to yellow flags? Especially coming up to a slow corner. It's probably already slowing down. Um, so, yeah. when you, you know, that's, I, <laughs> it's, I don't know, man. I don't know. It's the... Uh, the penalties sometimes, they get me a bit ruffled. They get me a bit ruffled in this series. 
Um, that's okay. Because we've got more to talk about than that. Um, especially Lee Holdsworth. Uh, his debut in the Tickford Mustang wasn't impressed. <laughs> wasn't impressed at all. I remember saying at the end of last year that I, I think that Holdsworth just might not be cut out for it. And I really wanted to prove me wrong. I really do. And I was kind of shocked when uh, Tickford picked him up after Winterbottom left. Um, given my misgivings about him. But he's a Tickford now. Um, he's basically given a second lifeline in his career after Michael Caruso has been dropped. Um, cause they were of course former teammates. Um, and, um, yeah, I just wasn't impressed with him this weekend at all. Uh, he wasn't good in qualifying. He was, I think the, the worst Tickford Mustang. It was the worst Mustang in qualifying. I think in both sessions, um, he had that silly mistake in race one. I don't even know what happened then. Like, maybe it wasn't a mistake. Maybe something went wrong. Um, of course, we heard him on the radio saying that the car just whipped around. Um, but drivers blame the cars for things sometimes. That happens. I'm not saying that he is blaming the car. Just, you know, it happens. Um, I And then Sunday wasn't any better either. Um... I think he crashed into the tyre barrier on Sunday as well. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he just drove straight into it. He locked the brakes up and went straight into the wall. Um, I'm not impressed with him. I really, I'm really not. Um, I want him to do better, of course. I'd like everybody, I'd like every driver to be a race, a race, there, yeah, race winner. Um, that'd be nice because then we'd all have a, we'd have an exciting race every weekend, which would be amazing. Um, but I just, yeah, wasn't impressed. Um, anyway. Beyond that, um, Red Bull. We'll talk about them as well briefly because they have lost, I think, their competitive edge. Um, And I didn't think it would make much of a difference, but this um, supercars um, banning the the complex multi-spring setup, uh, suspension setups um, from last year, I think has made a huge difference. Um, because basically Red Bull was the only team that mastered using it properly. Um, and I believe it was a big part of why they were so dominant last year, be- now, in hindsight, because then they're, they're not really anywhere now, are they? <laughs> they're not really anywhere. Um, and I think all the teams that were using single spring setups before have been able to refine them, and now they're ahead. Um, like, I, I believe DJR was using single spring all last year. Um and now they're ahead because they've been ma- they've been able to refine them and then they've been banned and Red Bull's lost their edge because of it. And I didn't think it would make much difference um, when I heard that they'd been banned. Um, but clearly it has because um, Shane finished third both times, um, but he didn't have anywhere near the pace that Scotty had. Nowhere near the pace. He was completely off compared to Scott. And Jamie Winkup finished second on race one. Uh, but race two, he finished seventh. Um, he didn't even make the top ten, and Shane barely made the top ten um, on Sunday. They barely made it. And Shane made it right on the death, um, literally the time he hit zero, and he went through and made it into tenth spot. Um, and then Winkup finished twelfth in qualifying. And um, it's been a long time since I've seen something like that happen, you know? Um that was, it was, we nearly had both Red Bull cars not in the top 10 shooter, which was, I don't know how long it's been since I haven't seen Red Bull or Triple uh, Eight, essentially, not in the top 10 of any given qualifying session, um, let alone one with a top 10 shooter in it. So that was pretty crazy. Um, I think, I think that both drivers are out driving that car right now i think that red bull is worse than it seems and i think that shane and jamie are out driving the car at the moment um and i think it also speaks to um i think maybe just jamie's might be might be getting might be getting on a bit (laughs) maybe i don't know he's not that old but um i think he has lost some of the raw pace that he used to have back in the triple eight days um and i think that's why we're seeing shane able to do a little bit more with the car um either that or Shane's just used to driving cars out driving cars he's 
done it pretty much his whole career up until he moved to Red Bull. Um, and Jamie just sort of hasn't. He started at, I think he debuted in Tasman Motorsport, I think, back in like 2005, um, which, you know, it's not in the grid anymore, so you can tell what sort of team that was. Um, and and I think he made the transition to Triple Eight like a year later. <laughs> so not that Triple Eight was a world beater immediately, but it was strong. It's always been strong. Um, back when they had the better electrical backing, um, I think 2006, 2007. Um, and it didn't take very many years for it to become a world beater because, I mean, that's when they started destroying Bathurst every year, him and Craig. Um, so not accusing Jamie of being a bad driver because he's clearly not a bad driver. Um, it takes, you know, he's beat he beat Craig Lowndes pretty much every year. Um, he's won the line shares. He's won the most championships ever in history. Um, and I know that I know he's in a dominant car and all that, but he's a good driver. He he has to be. You can't be a good driver and not outdrive Craig Lowndes. Like, you know, he's outdriven Craig Lowndes. Let's be honest. Like everyone, we all like Craig. We do, but if he's able to outdrive him so consistently, the man must be pretty good, and he is. Um, but I think Shane's got a little bit of edge on him at the moment um, because I think that's why Shane's. He showed it last year as well. Shane's just consistently able to outdrive the car and bring it to results that I don't think it deserves to be. And I think Shane's and Scotty's pure talent is the reason why we got such a close fight last year. And I think we'll see something similar shape up this year unless uh, Red Bull can pull their fingers out and actually develop the car properly um, because I think they've made a huge misstep over the break. I really do. Um, I think things are worse than they seem. Um... So hopefully it's not as dire as that. Um, hopefully it's just street circuits that Red Bull is a bit weak on um, because Adelaide is quite bumpy, uh, especially in Sector 1. Um, but they looked pretty weak through Sector 2 as well. And Sector 2 is pretty much just turn 8, the very fast right-hander. Um, and the Mustangs looked really strong through that sector compared to the... Well, compared to Red Bull, yeah. Like, not just the Commodores, just Red Bull, really. Um but also Sector 1 is very bumpy, um, and they didn't look super strong through there. It was really only Sector 3 that I thought the Red Bulls looked good. Um, so I think it's bumpy tracks, basically, and street circuits are bumpy. Um, lucky for them. Well, maybe not so lucky for them, but <laughs> because the next circuit is kind of a street circuit. But, you know, we'll get to that. Um, um, gosh, who else finished where? BJR's looking pretty good, too, except for Macaulay-Jones. Um, once again, I think they're, once again, it looks like they're kind of neglecting their third, their third car, but Percat and Slade performing well on both, both weekends. Um, Kelly Racing is exactly where they were last year. Um, I wasn't super impressed with, um, with, uh, Jacobson. (coughs) Oh, excuse me. Wasn't super impressed with Jacobson in his debut. Um, he was last both times, I think, out of the Kelly cars um um Heimgartner did great though I think Heimgartner did really well um I'm just impressed with him and I think given given the proper uh tools I think Heimgartner can be a real serious talent I think he's got some stuff behind him I really do um god Gary Rogers are in the same spot nothing to talk about there really um not sure what else they would expect given the relative inexperience of both the drivers on board um, and now we don't really have a measuring stick for either of them because last year Stanaway was at Tickford and he was compared to a bunch of really experienced drivers like Mostert and Waters and Winterbottom and uh, Golding was with Tander who again is a really experienced driver and occasionally Golding would actually outdrive Tander and that was like wow that's impressive you know um, but now they're compared to each other and like now we don't really have a, a, a good yardstick to measure them by other than whether or not they outdrive each other whether or not they're better than each other, which I don't doesn't really indicate much about their overall quality, just whether or not they're better than one another. Um, but they were quite even on the weekend, which is good. Um, Techno looked dire. They really did. They had a lot of problems. And uh, But Matt Stone Racing, given the... <laughs> I mean, I guess it shouldn't be too much of a shock. They've been, they've been, they're using the uh, 2018 Jamie Winkup Ford... Uh, Ford? Holden Commodore chassis as their basis for this year's car. Um, and Todd Hazelwood, his best career start of seventh on race two, 
good on him. And he drove a good race. He finished in the top 10, I think, his two best results in a row. Um, and it really goes to show that this year, this year the cars are so close together. They are so close together. Looking at the qualifying timings, I think there's 1.5 seconds between first to last. Um, and it's just... The top 10 will be separated by three tenths of a second or something like that. And it really goes to show that if you're able to get yourself into a good qualifying position, it really does sort you out for the rest of the race. The people who qualify in the teens generally stayed there. And the people who qualified um, in the in uh, the top 10 generally stayed there. And, you know, unless they made some kind of mistake. And I think all it takes is one person to have a good qualifying result, like Hazelwood having a good top 10 uh qualifying result and then he finished in the top 10 you know um i really do think more than ever that um this year is going to be determined by qualifying pace i think the field has just closed up that much right now um because yeah i think this is going to be a season to watch i think we're going to see some i think if we're going to see any surprise results like people who aren't djr or red bull winning races (laughs) um it's going to be this year. It's definitely going to be this year. That's my uh, that's my take. But let's have a look at the results. Um, <coughs> oh, man, I can't stop coughing anymore. Um, where am I? What am I doing? I don't want this. I want the qualifying results for Saturday or Friday. Yeah, that really threw me out too. Um, I missed out on qualifying the first qualifying session because it happened on... Um, happened on it happened on uh friday on saturday i was really confused i turned on the the telly to watch quali and it was the top 10 shooter and i was like what's going on um so i went back and watched it um cheers to ko for making that so easy which is by the way my streaming platform of choice now um but yeah that was weird (laughs) i don't know i don't really i don't i didn't even i don't know i'm so confused by this um i didn't know that they moved it to friday i didn't was it like that last year? I don't think it was. And then they had a practice session ahead of the race. After qualifying. I've never seen that before. That's so weird. <laughs> That's so odd. Um, but anyway. Uh, qualifying results were Scotty in first of a 119.5. Followed by Jamie Winkup, Fabian Coulthard, Nick Perkat, Cameron Waters, Will Davison, Shane Van Gisbergen, Rick Kelly, David Reynolds, and James Courtney with a 120 flat. So as you can see, five tenths between first and tenth. Um, Tim Slade in 11th, Chaz Mostert, Andre Heimgartner, Lee Holdsworth, Scott Pye, Mark Winterbottom with his debut for Team 18, which I thought went pretty well. He definitely did better than Lee Holdsworth did in that car. Can't really tell if the car is if the team has made improvements or if it's the driver or both. Um, but he did he did better than Holdsworth would have. Let's push, let's, let's put it that way. Um, or the Holdsworth did this time last year. Right? So let's just say that. Um, Macaulay Jones in seventeenth on his debut qualifying session. Um, Richie Stanaway in eighteenth. James Golding in nineteenth. Like I said, pretty much neck and neck. Um, one a one twenty point four zero and a one twenty point four six for them, so almost no difference. Um, Gary Jacobson in twentieth, Todd Hazelwood in twenty first, uh, Simona Di Silvestro, Jack LeBrock, and Anton Di Pasquale crashed in qualifying at turn eight. Um, which he made a very he made the sort of mistake that I would make in a playing a, a racing game where you just you're trying to go really fast with the corner and you turn in too early <laughs> so you hit the inside you hit the inside wall or something like that um he basically just turned in too soon on turn eight uh the fast right hander uh clipped the curb at a wrong angle which uh pushed him out wide and then he ran to the wall on exit um pretty simple mistake um very silly mistake to make in qualifying you don't have to do that sort of thing my friend just go back around and do another lap um but he, of course, finished in last for being out of qualifying. Um, no big surprises here, except for maybe how far... Actually, no, there's no real surprises here. Um, I'm surprised that in the um, Walkinshaw and Dreddy United car, which is still a mouthful to say, I'm surprised that neither of them... They seem to have less pace than last year. 
Um, which I'm surprised about. I thought they'd make gains this year, to be honest. Not a huge amount, but I thought they'd make more consistent top 10 appearances, at least. Um, and I'm also surprised that Erebus weren't as up there as I thought they'd be. Um, Reynolds complained a lot about understeer. Um, it's possible that they're just not suited to street circuits. Um, I think I recall last year that they weren't super great at street circuits either. Um, so we'll see. Um, but otherwise, very much uh, Tickford up there. Along with 23 Red, who have sort of been absorbed into Tickford, kind of. They're sort of their own thing still, but also they're a part of Tickford, I guess. I don't really know how that relationship's working out. Um, but 23 Red is definitely a separate team. Um, or at least it has the branding on the car still. So <laughs> I don't really know what's going on there. But Will Davison was very impressive. I was very impressed with him. Um, and I still think it's a shame that um, FBR at the time dropped him. Um, because, you know, he, he was good. He was good, you know. Um, but anyway, uh, then it was practice four, and that's when Macaulay Jones had a huge accident. Enormous. Um, so, couldn't find a huge amount of information on what exactly happened, but apparently it was a... F front brake failure? I think, um, you can watch replays of it, and, uh, it's either the front or the rear wheels that, um, one of them, the front wheels are either the front or the rear, just replace either or either, depending on which one I'm wrong about, uh, the front wheels are locked up completely, and the rear wheels are just spinning, like nothing's going on, um, it's one of the tight 90 degree corners, and he just comes in a million miles an hour, and, uh, completely shatters the back of the car on practice, um, and missed the start of the, uh, missed well missed the race because it, practice was on the same day as the race. Um, pretty spectacular accident would have been a bit scary for him since it was his first his first weekend really. So um, hopefully now he's got the the spectacular crash jitters out of the way, the, the Todd Hazelwood effect, <laughs> um, and he can get on to get on with things. Um, but he's okay, Macaulay Jones. He was a bit shaken, I think, but otherwise unhurt. Um, I really do hope that I do I do hope that he does he does well this year. I feel I'm worried for him. Um in the same way that I was worried about Tim Blanchard. Just ignore my phone talking to me. Um, um I don't think Blanchard was super bad last year. Yeah, he didn't compare to uh his teammates, but I, I have a feeling that the third car in that team is largely ignored. Um, for whatever reason, and I'm worried that Jones won't get a chance to show his stuff, basically, because he's in a, a crap car. Um, BJR seems to be a bit of a, a bit of a, a bit of the, uh, not a great place to debut into, because you can't really show what you got. Um, but he's okay. So next, we move into the top ten shootouts which we all love about Adelaide, of course. And I keep clicking on biographies instead of on the results, like a fool, like an idiot. Um, so, the top 10 shootouts. And I'll go in reverse order because I am just like to drum up that excitement. Uh, Rick Kelly with what was not a great lap of a 121 flat. Um, and then James Courtney with a 121 flat as well. Um, then we get into some more reasonable times. Um... Nick Perkat in 8th with a 120.6. Will Davison with a 120.5. David Reynolds with another 120.5. Shane Van Gisbergen with a 120.3. Cameron Waters, um, he put in a good lap with a 120.3 as well. Scott McLaughlin um, with a 120.2. Jim Winkup with another 120.2. And Fabian Coulthard, the only driver into the 119s by a significant margin. Three temps, a 119.8 for him. Um, his car was strong on Saturday, like I said before. Um, it's a shame that he wasn't able to convert that properly. Um, no real notes on the top 10 shooter, um, except for the fact that Fabian was really strong. You know, I was surprised with how good he was. Um, but now we're going to the race one results. And it was, like I already said before, Scott McLaughlin in first place. 
Um, Jamie Winkup in second and Shane Van Gisbergen in third. The very familiar Scotty, Jamie, Shane podium lineup that we've all sort of gotten used to. Um, but then, but then there's Tickford. That's a change, isn't it? Uh, Will Davison in fourth. Great to see him back up here. Um, he did really well. Um, and Chaz Moster in fifth. And he could have had that podium had he just been a bit more patient. Um, two very stupid mistakes. Like, really, he must have been kicking himself because he's all over the back of Shane. Shane's defending him, defending pretty hard considering they're only about halfway through the race. Um, and Chaz locks up into turn nine, the big hairpin after that, after um, that fast section in sector two. Um, and he just goes sailing off into the, uh, into the, um, what's it called? The, um, God, the extra road out of a corner. <laughs> Someone please tell me what that's called. I've completely gone blank. Um, but yeah, he completely sails off into the distance. Um, Shane nearly collected him. Uh, had a bit of foresight to see him coming down the inside and he just let him go. Um, he ended up behind, I think, Fabian Coulthard at the time, uh, who finished behind him in six, and he had to charge his way back through the field. Then again, he catches right back up to the back of Shane, and again, he makes the exact same mistake, locks up behind him, uh, this time at turn four or five, and just goes straight on. Ended up behind Will Davison, um, and just very silly mistakes, very silly. Um... So I guess, I mean, excellent work from Shane to frustrate Chaz enough to put him into a position where he was able to lock up the brakes is doing something as simple as going through a corner. But Shane wasn't holding him up that much. Um, Chaz really should have been a bit more patient, to be honest. But, you know, um, it, it, it he was in ominous form. Chaz was very fast for that race. So it's a bit, a bit of a miracle that he didn't manage to finish on the podium. Um, Fabian Coulthard in sixth. Um, considering... His, he got a 10-second stop-go penalty for his uh, jumping the start. Um, considering all the things that happened to him, sixth place is not too bad. Um, it really isn't. You know, he, he can walk away from that with his head held high, I reckon. Sixth place is not is not bad at all, considering all the things that happened to him on Saturday. Um, Nick Perkat in seventh. David Reynolds in eighth. Um... A bit of shocking from him. He just sort of fell through the field. Mark Winterbottom in ninth. He made a great charge through the field, up seven spots. Uh, James Courtney in 10th. Rick Kelly in 11th. Todd Hazelwood up eight spots to 12th. I wasn't really paying attention to him. He just sort of ended up near the top 10. But he had a great day as well. Um, Andre Heimgardner in 13th. James Golding in 14th. He had another pretty good race. Quite a bit quiet. Uh, Simona in 15th. She made good progress as well as Anton Di Pasquale, who finished in 16th. Uh, Tim Slade. He'll be a little bit disappointed with that in 17th. Richie Stanaway for one spot. Uh, Gary, Jacob there, Gary Jacobson in 19th. Uh, not at all moving from his qualifying position. Um, yeah, he was very quiet in his debut race. I don't think he did much at all, to be honest. Um, so, you know, we'll see how he, how he turns up. There's still plenty of races to go. I'm not going to write him off yet. Um, Jack LeBrock in 20th. He had a really quiet race. Um, Techno doesn't look great this year, to be honest. Um, which is sad because I like LeBrock and I think he's got good talent behind him, but I think that Techno car is a bit is a bit out of things this year. Um, which is weird considering they've got major backing now, but hey. Um, Lee Holdsworth in 21st after he crashed um, and he had to have repair done. And Cameron Waters in 22nd taken out after... A cool suit failure. So his um, the dry ice that they put in the cool box um, that cools down the cool suit, and then they put it in at the start of the race, uh, just before they go lights out. Um, and unfortunately, apparently, there is a risk that if they put it in too early, uh, the dry ice can get too cold and it can freeze the cool the coolant in the cool suit, uh, which prevents it from working. So um, yeah. He apparently felt fine, according to him, and he was a bit upset that he was pulled out, um, but it's the rules. Um, the rules are there for a reason. It's to stop people from dying of heat stroke. Um, so he was forced to be pulled out by basically supercars, um, which I think was the right call, um, considering some of the flack that um, 
got dished out at Erebus for not changing out David Reynolds last year at Bathurst when he had a very similar issue, except it was about being tired rather than hot, but they caused the same problems. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I think it's definitely best to enforce these things, even if the drivers feel they can do it, because it was over 50 degrees in the cabin, and if he's wearing all that fireproof clothing, he's wearing a helmet, all that stuff on. Um, there's no way he's not overheating, you know? I don't care how he says he feels. Um, there's no way you're going to the end of the race in 50 degree ambient temperature wearing a bunch of clothing. Wearing a bunch of clothing, you know? I can't even make it anywhere in 50 degree weather without any clothes on. <laughs> Let alone wearing a bunch of fireproof gloves and a helmet and all this stuff. Um, so yeah, I think it was the right move to pull him out. Um, and a lot of drivers had problems with um, the footwell getting really hot. Shane's um, boot was melting. I think, um, and apparently this is because the exhaust system runs right by the footwell. Why? <laughs> Why does it run by the footwell? Um, we live in a country where, we live in a country where being cool, um, keep being, yeah, being cold, being at a good temperature is so important. It can be dangerous to be out in the heat, you know, um, and they're racing in cars that reach temperatures ambient temperatures in the cabin of over 50 degrees pretty easily if it's a hot day and then they've also got a footwell that's got an exhaust pipe running next to it which makes it i don't know how hot it is um no one actually gave any actual temperatures but if it's hot enough to melt a racing boot <laughs> like and there was many drivers that took their f they were using uh, the accelerator of their left foot so they could put their right foot out to cool it down. <sighs> if supercars wants to move to a summer-based calendar like they've said they want to do for next year, um, if they want to put the majority of their races in summer, they're going to have to change this because guess what? Most of Australia hits 40-degree days in summer. You know? Not at the same time, but the likelihood of another 40 degree event happening like the one we had at Adelaide just gone is going to go up exponentially, especially at Adelaide. You know, if we can't go to Adelaide in the middle of summer, it's already bad enough. Like, it should be a winter event. It really should. And um, with how hot Adelaide gets in summer. But we don't have enough, there's not enough places in Australia that are reliably cool to have this many summer events without making them all night events. Like, we could go to, in the height of summer, we could go to maybe Tasmania, New Zealand, maybe Phillip Island, and maybe some other coastal places like Newcastle. But that's kind of it. Everything else is super hot in summer. And if they're going to have problems like this in March in Adelaide, like, I don't see how we're even going to be able to run at Adelaide at all with a summer-focused calendar. It's just going to be unsafe for the drivers. It really would be. Like, if it's that hot that the drivers are struggling to put their foot in the footwell like and yeah it could just they could just change it like the the cool suit system is great it's a great system and it keeps the drivers going um but they need to change the way this exhaust system works if they're going to be racing in summer because i can't imagine what's going to happen um and i didn't even finish going for the race results uh scott pie not classified because he DNF'd after running into Lee Holdsworth, as I mentioned before, and also almost being given a penalty to boot. So there you go. Um, that was the results of race one. Not a huge amount to talk about other than the fact that the Ford Mustang looks incredibly good this year. Um, so let's go to qualifying for race two, which actually did happen on Sunday. Hallelujah. I wasn't, <laughs> I didn't miss it. Um, Scott McLaughlin in first, followed by Chaz, and then Cameron Waters, and Nick Percat, Fabian Coulthard, David Reynolds, Anton Di Pasquale. Great lap from him. Will Davison, Todd Hazelwood going through right at the death, and Shane Van Gisbergen were your top 10. Um, Scott went at 119.4, and Shane with a 119.8. It's only four tenths separating them this time around. Um... There was an absolute flurry of activity at the end of qualifying. I think pretty much everyone except for the top three 
set those laps like right at the death of qualifying. It was crazy. It was crazy to watch. Um, super good to see. Um, but yeah, it was very, uh, it was very exciting to watch that one live. Um, Tim Slade missing out by only um, what, one hundredth of a second, really. Um, but good lap from him. Jamie Winkup in 12th. That was a bit of a surprise. Scott Pye doing pretty good. Uh, Lee Holdsworth in 14th. Like I said, worse of the Mustangs. Um, doesn't reflect great on him. Uh, James Courtney in 15th. Rick Kelly, Andre Heimgartner, James Golding, Richie Stanaway. Pretty much exactly matching their times. Uh, Simona and Macaulay Jones. He was back out this time around. Jack LeBrock and Gary Jacobson in not last place because Mark Winterbottom didn't make it out into qualifying uh, with a... Um, I think it was a brake failure that they didn't manage to fix on time. Uh, so he started in 24th position. Um, like I said, that was a real exciting qualifying session. There were a lot of drivers that came out of nowhere, like Todd Hazelwood, um, right at the last second and just nabbed that uh, nabbed that top 10 spot. It was great to watch. That's the sort of stuff that we need more of in qualifying. Um, because, yeah, that was great. Um, and now we'll move on to the top 10 shootout. For Sunday, and again, we'll go in reverse order because Fabian Coulter, DSQ, big fat DSQ for opening the bonnet. Um, was it harsh? Maybe. You could argue that. Um, but I think it's pretty clear that you're in Park Ferme. Park Ferme means don't open the bonnet. They opened the bonnet. That's all it is, really. Rules are rules. Um, and, you know, I don't think anyone complained. They just race control picked it up. And that's it, you know, you just gotta, you can't risk these things, but that's all it is, really. Uh, Chaz Mostert, uh, in ninth with no time set because he got a curb strike, unluckily, um, on his first lap. Um, I think the curb strike system in Adelaide works a lot better because the drivers are very aggressive over that, over that turn two curb, um, and they can be very aggressive. Um, so I wasn't too upset when he got a curb strike. Obviously, I was upset because we want to see people put their laps in, you know? Um, it's not fun when they get a curb strike and they have to pull out. Um, I, I still think there should be a better way of policing whether or not the cars go too far over the curb. Um, like maybe a five second penalty, which I know would be last place anyway in a top 10 shootout. But like, you know, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. I don't know what the solution is, but it, yeah, I don't like the curb strike system. Um... But 8th place was Anton Di Pasquale with a 120.75. Todd Hazelwood with a 120.7. Good good from him. Uh, Nick Perkow with a 120.54. Will Davison with a 120.39. Cameron Waters with a 120.21. David Reynolds with a 120.19. Shane Van Gisbergen, the first one to go out, with a 119.92. And Scott McLaughlin completely obliterating everybody else once again with a 119.66. Um, that was a good that was a good top ten shootout as well, mainly because Shane went out first and no one could beat him. Um, it was quite <laughs> that was quite it's quite interesting to watch um, how well it went for Shane in the end. Um, but then we'll go on to race two, and um, boy, did some interesting things happen in race two. So first we'll go through the results. Scott McLaughlin in first place, followed by Cameron Waters and Shane Van Gisbergen, and boy, that was. That could have been such a tasty battle at the end had we got a safety car or something, but we were denied, unfortunately. Um, I do wish that... Um, I think it was Jacobson that ended up off the track and uh, um, but <laughs> Crompty got really excited um, that we were going to get a safety car, and I got really excited as well. I was super keen for um, a classic charge from Shane. Cameron would have been right in the back of Scotty, it would have been great to watch. Um, unfortunately, we were denied because Jacobson got it to move again. And curse you, Jacobson. You should have just left it there. <laughs> um, but that's okay. I'm glad he was able to get it moving. I'm uh, disappointed that we didn't get quite the exciting finish that we could have gotten. But we did get Shane making his charge up to Cameron. Um, he didn't manage to make the pass. Cameron was too much of a brick wall in the end. But that's okay. Great drive from Cameron Waters to get where he was. And a good strategy call from Tickford. They pitted him early, and it worked out for them. Um, Tim Slater, Nick Perkett in 4th and 5th. That's a great result from BJR. And Mark Winterbottom up 18 spots into 6th place. I don't even know how he did that. Um, it's not the first time, though. It happens a lot in supercars where the, the car that starts at a position in last 
is just able to make some kind of wild charge up through the field with some risky strategies that you can't normally make when you're on midway through the field, like pitting really early and <coughs> excuse me, and that sort of thing. Um, I think Winterbottom's one to watch this year. I think it'll be interesting to see what kind of pace that car ends up having um, because two very consistent results um, across both races. Bit of a dark horse, maybe. He was able to fend off Jamie Winkup through most of this race. Um, so that should show you what kind of pace this car has. It means it's least a podium sitter on a good day, you know? So um, that's one to keep an eye on. Definitely one to keep an eye on. Uh, speaking of Jamie Winkup, he finished in 7th place. Uh, Will Davison in 8th. David Reynolds in ninth. Todd Hazelwood in 10th. Best career result from him. Good on him. Uh, great to see him actually up there and mingling with, you know, the other drivers. <laughs> because um, he just sort of wasn't last year. And it wasn't his fault, but um, it's good to see him up there and actually doing things. Um, Lee Holsworth in 11th. Um, not the most dire of races for him, but only not last because of some very some silliness in pit lane, which I'll get to. Um, James Courtney in 12th, Andre Heimgartner in 13th, Anton Di Pasquale in 14th, Chaz Moster in 15th, and he should consider himself lucky that he even finished that high up, um, <laughs> which again I'll get to. Um, Simone Di Silvestro in 16th, Scott Pye in 17th, not a great result from him. Uh, Richie Stanaway and James Golding right next to each other in 18th and 19th. Um, Fabian Coulthard, in 20th position because of a late penalty for spinning, I believe, Scott Pye. Um, although I don't quite remember. Maybe it was Jack LeBrock. I don't know. Uh, Jack LeBrock in 21st. Gary Jacobson in 22nd. Macaulay Jones in 23rd after a... I think it was a retirement. He only completed 57 laps, so um, I believe he had a mechanical problem with his car, um, unfortunately for him. Um, bit of a shame in his debut weekend, but that's the way things go. Um, and Rick Kelly in 24th position, only completing 55 laps. Why was he in 24th position after only completing 55 laps? Did something happen to him? Well, <laughs> if I've done my job right, well, it was in the thumbnail. Um, probably the strangest incident I've ever seen in supercars or really any motorsport. Um, Chaz Moster got basically pit maneuvered in pit lane by Rick Kelly. Um, so what happened is a safety car came out. Uh, Jack LeBrock stopped on the side of the road with some kind of issue. Um, safety car came out and pretty much everyone jumped into the pits um, to take an extra pit stop, put on more fuel, change some tires maybe. Um, and as often happens when safety cars come out in supercars, there was a bit of drama. So last year... Uh, Craig Lowndes ran into the back of Garth Tander and bent his steering at Newcastle. That was, I think, I'm pretty sure that was the last safety car related pit stop accident we had. And, uh, this year, an unsighted and, um, an unsighted Rick Kelly, or unsighted, well, yeah, an unsighted Rick Kelly, um, suddenly found, uh, Chas Mostert being released into the fast lane that he was already on. And, uh, Rick Kelly was well alongside him. He was well alongside him. He must have had a more than almost more than half the car was alongside Chaz by the time Chaz actually got into the fast lane. Um, and um, I'll have a look at got a lot of quotes here from this because it was a <laughs> it was a real strange one, but I'll just I'll finish describing it. Um, so Chaz, I suppose the spotter from Tickford really needs to be kicked because it was ridiculously bad, a ridiculously unsafe release was released pretty much alongside Rick Kelly. Um, and basically all that happened is that Rick ran into him once. Uh, you can see him dab the brakes. Um, and I guess Kelly's thought process is that, oh, he's ran into me and he's in the wrong. He'll stop. Um, he didn't stop. <laughs> so they just sort of kept running into each other until, uh, Chaz got spun around and then he was at a complete 90 degree angle, uh, perpendicular to pit lane. Um, and just blocked it <laughs> amazingly just blocked it which i think was a bit of a lifesaver for wink up because he managed to take his pit stop and just sort of get out because it happened right at the end of pit lane right alongside the red bull garage so with jamie wink up still in the garage so he'd been double stacked behind shane 
And, um, yeah, he'd been double stacked behind Shane, and he basically had free reign to get out. Um, there's a few cars that managed to squeeze their way by, um, but once Jamie left, um, Fabian was able to leave, and then pretty much everybody else went around underneath. Um, Chaz pulled reverse, get out of the way. Both cars had major damage. Chaz was given a pit lane drive through penalty for an unsafe release, which I don't think is good enough, to be honest, because that was shocking. Um, Tickford really need to kick themselves for that one because it was absolutely shocking. I, t- I have never seen a worse unsafe release ever. He was basically released directly into Rick Kelly. And, like, um, you could argue all day and night about whether or not Chaz should have backed off or Kelly should have backed off. Um, personally, in my opinion, um, Kelly had the right to be there and Chaz should have backed off. Um, but Kelly didn't do himself any favors by not bagging off, did he? Because <laughs> he was the one that ended up in last place and Chaz ended up in 15th. So, um, in a perfect world, uh, Rick would have backed off, Chaz would have gotten a pit lane penalty and Rick Kelly would have been laughing. Um, but instead we got some weird gamesmanship with them both coming into the pits, Rick Kelly going real slow through pit lane um, as Rick Kelly went into the garage, um, but really, um, really, I, it's a hundred percent Tickford's fault, um, and, uh, I'll just go into, um, this one here, um, where, uh, Mostert did apologize to Rick Kelly afterwards, um, and Mostert said, it was just a lack of communication at the end of the day. Definitely our fault. So nice to see him taking a little bit of responsibility for it because he was definitely very mad. And you can't blame him for being mad at the time. Um, you can't blend into the you can't blend into the fast lane when there's another car there. It was really a tight pits for me. I tried to get into the box at the best angle I could. I had to get pushed back, and it was just a lack of communication on our part. I thought I was good to go, but I couldn't see much either. At the end of the day, I ruined Rick's race. I'm really apologetic for that. I never want to do that. Uh, it's the first time I've had a spin in pit lane, so I'll put that on the credentials. <laughs> Let's take away a positive from it. Um, and uh, although appreciative of the apology, Kelly laid the blame on Mustang's car controller and not Mostert himself, which I believe is correct. Um, he's come down and apologized, which is really good. It's pretty rare these days, but it's really not for him to apologize, said Rick Kelly. It's one of those things that I believe at that point should still be in the control of his car controller, who obviously didn't alert him to the fact I was next to him. There's not much he could have done in that situation. Um, but Kelly also denied that he didn't have, he couldn't have done anything to avoid the spinning of Mostert, which isn't really true. Um, but he does explain it in his own words, which I think shed a little bit of light on it. Uh, it was an awkward hit. For the first impact, no, because I was that far up, which is true. Um, normally, it's a close call, but this one wasn't. I was right up alongside him when we hit. Once we hit, I thought, he knows I'm there now. He'll straighten back up. But he didn't. He belted me back in. He belted back into me a second time. I thought he knows now, and then a third time, which spun him around in front of me. It was awkward for both of us. It's unfortunate because with the pace we had and the strategy, we were in a good position today. Um, and then Moster didn't really put any blame on Rick Kelly. He just said it was a better question for him. Um, and at the end of the day, it was super tight. And uh, you know, he spun me into the fence. That's basically all he said. Um, I got to agree with this one from the driver's point of views. Um, I do think Kelly could have done more than he did uh, I think he could have helped himself out a little bit because really it was his own race that he ruined in the end um, by not doing anything um, does he have does he have the right to be there yes um, but you know you've also got to protect your own race when someone else does something stupid on the road just because you've got the right away it doesn't mean you want to have an accident um, same thing applies in racing if you don't want you don't want to have an accident you know you got to avoid it um, let the stewards decide whether or not Mostert was in the wrong, which he was, and he was given a penalty anyway. Um, but a very, very strange situation. But the thing that gets me is that uh, Tim Edwards, uh, Tickford boss, is laying the blame entirely on Rick Kelly, <laughs> um, which I'm not a fan of. Um, and, oh, I'm just going to read this one out to you. Um, it's a difficult one because we were 10 meters from our own pit bays doing three point turns trying to get out, said Edwards. 
No one was really focusing on what was coming down pit lane because we were too busy pushing the car back, pulling it forward, so it was a very difficult situation. To be honest, I blame Rick because that was the dumbest thing. He just driving straight into the side of Chaz at full steam and taking himself out of the race. There's a middle pedal in the car and he didn't touch it. <sighs> Tim, buddy. <laughs> I know you're not listening, but you released Chaz into him. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> it doesn't come down to anything else than that. And He does, he does go on to say that, of course, Chaz was done for unsafe release, but he doesn't put any of the blame on his own people. And, I mean, he even says it, like, a sentence ago. Um, no one was really focusing on what was coming down pit lane because we were too busy pushing the car back, pulling it forward. What? <laughs> it's, you should always be focused on what's coming down pit lane, especially when it's as busy as it is during a safety car period. What's wrong with you? Um... Yeah, no, mate, it's your fault. Um, 100%. Um, should Kelly have backed out? Probably. Right? Um, should he have needed to? No. Not at all. Um, 100% the fault is on whoever told Chaz to go. You know? And the fact that Tim Edwards can't take any fucking... <laughs> oh, sorry. Nearly swore. Freaking responsibility. <laughs> any hacking responsibility for this one. Um is just, it's, it's concerning, um, it really is, um, yeah, yeah, oh god, I just, the lack of self-awareness here is shocking, um, at the least, you know, um, and gross at best, so, and then he goes on to say that, uh, they had a great weekend with the Mustangs and whatnot, um, but, no, it's just, if he's not having a talk to whoever released him, then, you know, all hope is lost because this sort of thing is just going to happen again. Um, and it really brings up the question, should pit lane be modified? Or should the rules be modified? Um, this has happened every single time I get a safety guard called. Something like this happens. Uh, last year, like I said, Craig Lowndes completely broke his steering by running into Garf Tanda from double stacking. Um, basically the crux of the problem comes up because there's not enough room for cars to double stack and then also for cars to exit and enter their pit garages properly at the same time. So for instance, uh, Red Bull is in front of DJR this year and we saw it with Scott struggling to get around from behind Jamie Winkup because he's trying to stack behind Shane. Um, I think that pit lanes need to be extended um, to allow for cars to double stack behind each other rather than in kind of in the fast lane but sort of not really in the fast lane um, but there's lots of solutions to this either widen pit lane so that cars can sort of sit three wide rather than two wide um, properly and so cars can actually navigate around pit lane extend pit lane so cars can sit behind each other a bit better so they can get in and out easier when there is double stacking going on or close um, pit lane while the safety car is out and this one I'm not a fan of because this is when we get the most interesting periods in supercars but um, if they're not willing to do the other two things then things like this are going to keep happening uh, there are going to keep there are going to be more incidents in pit lane every time a safety car is called because it happens pretty much every time it's rare that we get through without any kind of incident and it's when we get the most penalties uh, it's when we get the most silly mistakes because they are trying to pay, they're, they're trying to look at too many things, you know. There's too much stuff going on. Um, but yeah, the fact that Tim Edwards can't lays the entire blame on on Rick Kelly is ridiculous. Even Chaz Moster went to apologise, you know. And Chaz is a good bloke, um, and I don't think he'd apologise unless he, you know, he really thought that there was something to apologise for. Um, so yeah. Not happy with Tim Edwards, um, but when have I ever been happy with Tim Edwards, you know? <laughs> That's the real question. Um, he wasn't great last year either, but hey, he's running that team. What do I know about running teams? Not a, nothing at all. I just sit here and criticize people because um, I'm a cheeky bastard. Um, wow. What a, what, a opening, what a opening weekend. Really. Seriously. Um, we've gleaned a lot of information 
from the teams, um, mainly um, that the Mustangs are way better than I thought they'd be, um, and that this double spring ban has really affected Red Bull. Um, I think we're in for an interesting season, and we could potentially see a double world champion. A uh, world champion? We could definitely <laughs> potentially see a double championship from Scotty, um, which would be cool for him, because he's a good guy. He's a great driver. If anyone deserves a double world... Ch- uh, why do I keep saying that? If anyone deserves a double championship, not a world championship, a championship. If anyone deserves a double championship, it's definitely Scotty. Um, hopefully we don't see any more of this complete domination that we saw this weekend because my god was race one a bit dull in the middle like whoa (laughs) hopefully we don't see too much more of that um but race two was great um and qualifying top 10 shootouts were great so hopefully we see more of that um if you have anything to add or anything you want to say or oh that's what i was going to do if you got a question for me and you want me to talk about in the next podcast, please leave a question for me to answer in the comments below. Um, I'd love to start a new segment where you where I answer questions. Um, obviously, I don't really expect anybody to leave a question straight away. Um, so if this segment remains empty for the whole year, then I'll look really foolish. But otherwise, I'd love to start answering you guys' questions uh, if you're listening and you have something you want me to talk about specifically, please leave a comment. Um, I'd love to answer some specific questions um, about supercars in general um, and talk about what you guys want to hear. Um, so if you got one of those, pop it down in the comments below. I'll read it and answer it in the next one. As for the next one, Melbourne, the support race or races for the Formula One Grand Prix on the 14th of March is when that kicks off. So two weeks from now. Practice one and two. Oh, practice practice on one and two on Thursday. Followed by qualifying one and two on Thursday as well. Um, qualifying three and four on Fridays. Uh, followed by the race on race one on Friday. Race two on Saturday. Race three also on Saturday. And race four on Sunday before the Grand Prix. That's your next one. Um, Maybe don't have to get too pumped for that one because those races are very short. I think they're like 15 laps long each. Um, But it is a support race. And um, if you are into Formula 1, it's a great watch because you get to see supercars and Formula 1. What's better than that? Nothing. (laughs) So, I will see you for the roundup of the Melbourne events. But until then, feel free to leave me a question for me to answer in the next podcast in the comments below. Let me know what you thought of the Chas Mostert and Rick Kelly incident, who was right and who was wrong. And also, whether or not Fabian Coulthard deserved to be disqualified from the top 10 shootouts for breaking Park Ferme conditions. Uh, As always, feel free to tell me I'm wrong and I'm an idiot. Because I am wrong and an idiot. <laughs> I'm always an idiot. Um, so feel free to tell me how wrong I am in the comments as well. Otherwise, if you enjoyed, hit that like, subscribe for more. I will see you in the next V8 Supercars fancast. Thanks for watching. See you later. Bye.